I think of Juneteenth as our Independence Day because the original Independence Day does not take us into consideration. I am Angela Thorpe. I am a public historian based in North Carolina. Uh, in my work, I work to bring forth the rich and deep stories of African American people in a number of creative ways, including exhibit programs and other experiences. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed January 1st, 1863. And it's interesting because this document is seen as a real sort of win for the United States, specifically the Union. It's signed in the midst of the Civil War, but what we have to understand is that this document or this proclamation does not free all enslaved people. And so when we think about how is the Emancipation Proclamation enforced, we have to think about how is the Union Army specifically sort of advancing through Confederate states to share this information. Texas is a hot spot, if you will, for defiance of the Emancipation Proclamation specifically. I think that is part of what makes the Juneteenth story so special. If we think of Texas geographically, it is in the furthest reaches of the Confederacy. That information is not getting to Texas like it is some other places. And if you're thinking about the Union Army physically advancing through the South, that journey is taking a long time. Again, there's just a defiance on the part of a number of people, right? A true refusal to let people out of bondage. You know, wait till, I think now they said it wake them six months out of that, six months and turn them loose on the 19th of June. That's why you know you celebrate that day, Colors Force. Celebrate that day. We have some examples of people literally forcing the individuals, the black individuals that they are holding in bondage to travel as far as Texas to escape this impending reality of freedom from slavery. Again, Texas eventually absorbed close to 150,000 enslaved people to avoid impending Black liberation. General Granger is one of the, the foremost people who is responsible for, I guess you can say, occupying Texas once it falls to the Union and enforcing new realities in Texas and Galveston specifically. June 19th, 1865, Juneteenth sort of becomes a reality. General Order 3 is announced in which soldiers are literally going from place to place, space to space, announcing through Galveston, Texas, hey, enslaved Texans are free. I think what's really interesting though in the language of his order, if you read it, is that it encourages or outright instructs enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, to stay where they are. This order says, hey, you're free, but just, just stay where you are. That doesn't work. And people know that that's not going to work. And so they find ways to flee, to leave, even at the expense of themselves and of their lives. Members of the Union Army, including US colored troops, are literally sort of traveling from courthouse to church, to farm, to plantation, to inform formerly enslaved people, hey, you're free. When we think of this concept of liberation, I think it's so fascinating, incredible, and powerful that formerly enslaved men who are now U.S. colored troops are an active part of spreading that information and sort of enabling their brothers and sisters to know, hey, you are free, join me, right? You're liberated. So black people did so much to secure their freedom, even after they were told they were free. But if you've been held in bondage for generations and generations, 
What does that actually look like? Will you even survive leaving that place? Will you be murdered en route? Will you be killed trying to leave? Those are realities for some people. We have documentation of people literally being murdered as they are trying to leave when they have been set free. Some of the earliest Juneteenth celebration, or I should say the earliest Juneteenth celebration, took place June 19th, 1866, sort of in an deliberate effort to undercut Juneteenth celebration specifically is Black people are barred from gathering <laughs> in certain spaces and places. They found a way in spite of these really silly rules and regulations. And so they would gather on, on public lands that were not subject to some of these laws and restrictions. They would gather in spaces like churches that they built. They included public readings of the Emancipation Proclamation. They included gatherings and food. They included parades, picnics, and they evolved from there. The earliest Juneteenth celebrations really centered on life, liberty, citizenship, liberation, and celebrating all of those things. On, on the 19th, you know, that's called, you they said, have to give them a big dinner on the 19th. But now we didn't know, I'll tell you, I don't hide the other side of the folks, you know, freedom. We didn't know. They just thought, you know, just feeding us, you know, just had a long table and just had uh, just a little everything you want to eat, you know, and drink, you know. You see a number of different foods that show up at uh, Juneteenth celebrations over time. Some of the popular ones are like red velvet cake and red soda pop. And just in general, you're seeing a lot of red food. We think that it connects back to West African tradition. Red is a symbolic color that symbolizes so much. It symbolizes spirituality, strength, resilience, protection. And so that is one reason you see these red foods show up at Juneteenth celebration. You know, as people moved from Texas and moved about the country, migrated about the country, they carried those Juneteenth traditions with them. Going into the 20th century, it starts to fizzle out as attacks on Black citizenship increase and you almost see it sort of completely fizzle out after World War II. Black men and in some cases Black women have gone to serve their country. They're demanding full citizenship. They did it the World War previously. Nothing panned out. They're coming back demanding full citizenship again and again, once again, nothing pans out. And so you're seeing this sort of celebration about citizenship, life, and liberty fizzle because people are not getting that. I would say increased celebration of Juneteenth kind of popped back up around the civil rights movement. 1968 specifically, the Poor People's March on Washington was actually designed to coincide with Juneteenth, right? The, the original date was June 19th, 1968. Dr. King was assassinated before it could actually occur. And people sort of reclaim that day and this sort of term, if you will, as an opportunity to celebrate liberation in a place, space, and time where Black people are once again very actively trying to liberate themselves. I think in terms of today, though, young people are becoming more aware of Juneteenth in large part due to social media. Another thing that is very, very powerful about what we're seeing now is the power of Black protest, right? We have seen Black people literally gather, move their bodies, and call out injustice in generations and generations. 
over time, right? We've seen it during the reconstruction era. We've seen it during the 19 teens. We've seen it during the 1940s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. This is another resurgence, again, of Black people gathering, moving, speaking, and calling out injustice in order to be liberated. And, you know, when I think about people who lived in Texas and might have been liberated after Juneteenth and fled to Union lines so that they could, again, literally take their freedom and create new lives for themselves. I keep thinking of like masses of Black people gathering and moving in order to achieve freedom. And is that not what we are seeing now? It is a through line, not just a through line, but again, a cultural retention. Black people gathering and moving in order to seek freedom. Once again, it is phenomenal that we continue to do what our ancestors did in order to get closer to liberation. I think it is absolutely vital for African Americans to have a nationally recognized date that, again, recognizes our freedom. I think as we see organizations and companies pay more attention to this holiday and give value to this holiday, it will absolutely create more momentum around making it a holiday that is recognized in states that don't recognize it and perhaps even at the federal level. I think companies could take it a step further by again really digging deeply, understanding the principles of Juneteenth and sort of applying those principles to their own work and, and their own values. Are they running equitable work environments? Are they adopting inclusive hiring practices? What are they doing in their communities? Are these companies putting money towards the movement for Black Lives to, again, sort of further what we're seeing, further protests? Or are these companies putting pressure on lawmakers or, or general assemblies to make change? How will you be celebrating Juneteenth? <laughs> So I will be celebrating Juneteenth by working. I'm going to be honest. However, I love the work that I do and I think the work that I do is critical. And so for me, I'm very excited that I get to spend Juneteenth telling stories of Black liberation and resilience from the state of North Carolina. And so that's what I'll be doing on Juneteenth. The best way to follow my work is by following the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. You can follow us online at aahc.nc.gov.